the ILW uh, has been part of our life. It still is, which we got a lot of family in this union right now. I'm a third generation longshoreman. My grandfather was down here. My uncles, my dad, my aunts. They're like loaded to the gills with longshoremen. My dad got in in 1941 as a, as a registered member. So uh, he believed in the union so strong. He respected this union, man. He was, uh, uh, he was hardcore. Well, you have to understand that uh, my dad was uh, probably 19, 20, 21 when he got his book. But the times before that in, in uh, East Wilmington were, were tough. They were very poor. Very poor, you know. They all uh, migrated where all the Mexican families kind of lived together to help each other. And uh, I remember my dad telling the story that when they went to war, he was worried about how my mom was going to be able to provide for his three little sons. And um, my dad kind of converted the garage into a place so that he could leave them with my grandma, my grandpa, and my other aunts so that he knew his wife and his kids would be taken care of. But when they migrated here, it, it, they were very, very poor. Kathy Mena's family's grandparents migrated to the Los Angeles Harbor area from Mexico in search of a better life. Her husband Ray's family has a similar story, but his grandparents came from Italy. Both Kathy and Ray's fathers found that better life through membership in the International Longshoremen and Warehouse Union, the ILWU. Interestingly, each of their dads also had two brothers that were ILWU members. In fact, there were no family sponsorships left when Ray's father wanted to join, and he needed to be sponsored by his uncle's friend. A guy named Stud Meadows, great name, waterfront name, uh, sponsored my dad and didn't want anything for it. You know, one of those guys, just stand-up guy, hey man, it's your family, I'll sponsor you. The positive transformation that the ILW provided for the family and Mena's families, and many others, has made Ray and Kathy passionate believers in the power of the union, so it would seem they would have a natural connection. When they first met, Kathy was working at the ICTF rail yard as a clerk in the Allied Division of ILW Local 13, and Ray was the ILW Allied Business Agent for the site. Ray recalls it was a bumpy first meeting with Kathy. Uh, she was a uh, new hire, and uh, she showed up at a union meeting and was really frustrated talking with some of the other uh, women in the clerical department saying that uh, they weren't being represented. And uh, somehow uh, she got up at the meeting and uh, uh, she uh, uh, made a motion to have a recall election on yours truly. <laughs> the clerk saw that I guess I was some kind of a leader and they chose me to approach him about not representing the clerks that well. So I called a meeting and unfortunately, Ray had leaders behind him and he had the skill and the knowledge already on how to kind of neutralize uh, dissent. The reason there wasn't uh, a direct representation because we didn't have a shop steward. We couldn't get anybody to step up and take the position. At the end of the meeting, rather than laugh and walk away and say, hey, you know, I got her, it was a different thing. He stuck out his hand and he said, look, why don't you join my team? Anybody that could mobilize folks in such a short period of time needs to be involved in a union. And I explained to her why we needed a, a shop steward and we didn't have one. I said, if the union sent you to LA Trade Tech for grievance and arbitration classes, would you be willing to step up and be the shop steward? Well, she took the classes and uh, from that time, she was on fire for the union. She became not only the shop steward in the clerical department, but the, the men in the other two departments, the mechanical and the uh, yard, ended up voting her chief shop steward. So that's uh, how uh, Kathy and I um, 
uh, started our relationship. <laughs> Paul and Kathy were working at the ICTF, the only near dock rail yard in the Los Angeles Long Beach Port Complex, represented by the ILW's Allied Division. Securing and holding jurisdiction of the site was strategically very important for the ILW, and a major struggle ensued when the company operating the facility staged a hostile takeover to remove them. Our connection to the power in the harbor, being the longshoremen, is something they didn't like. Um, the railroad got together with their attorneys and they found a loophole, and it's called the Rail Labor Act. Under the 1940 Railway Labor Act, if the railroad runs a facility by itself without having a subcontractor in between, according to the Railway Labor Act, they have to use what they call the Transportation Communication Union. So the railroad devised this plan that if they canceled the subcontractor agreement, that the workforce at LW was gone. And when we got there, they already had uh, people sitting in our jobs, sitting at my desk as a clerk doing our job. And it was just unbelievable because we come to find out that they train these workers behind our back for a whole year. Instead of hiring railroad union members that were on furlough, that were just on the layoff list, they went to right to work states like Texas. And there was ads for, how would you like to work in sunny Southern California for this much money and be housed? And they brought the scabs in on buses and Kathy and I uh, were there when the buses pulled up and the, and the scab workers, the replacement workers, were uh, walking off the bus and, and they were just making horrible gestures, raising their middle finger at us, uh, um, spitting on the ground saying, are you lazy union guys? We got your jobs now. And um, it was a hostile takeover. It'll never leave my mind that it was Federal Railroad Police that escorted us out. Uh, Long Beach Police Department, LAPD, and Carson Sheriffs were all there. I guess they were waiting for us to go ballistic, but the night before we broke great, we broke uh, the gate records and stuff. We wanted to keep working. We weren't going to do anything. We wanted to prove to them that hey, we're the workforce. Kathy uh, uh, tried to get up in the office to get the uh, purses for the women uh, that did a lot, worked on the computers and the clerical work, and the railroad police said you can't go up in there. And they literally wouldn't let people collect their belongings, their purses. So I just lost it. And um, I pushed a police, a railroad police officer out of the way, and I ran up the stairs. And uh, Kathy, Kathy says, Ray, Ray, stop, stop. And I got to the top of the stairs, and I had several railroad police officers grab me and put a 38 pistol to my head. And uh, they said, you're not going any farther. It was horrible. It was horrible. And we stayed out on the picket line for six to seven months. You know, we had to get money for like 20 families that were going through cancer, babies that were born with bad hearts. We had to get the funding from up and people from up and down the West Coast, other ILW members, donated money so that we could keep their medical going. Um, we had two or three suicide attempts. We had marriages fall apart because all of a sudden you can't pay the bills, you can't pay the mortgage. Uh, it was very traumatic and not being employed. And then on top of it, every industry, the refineries or anywhere we went, it was like as if we were blackballed. The minute you put on there that you worked at the Southern Pacific Railroad, they knew you were ILWU. And I guess they just, hey, we don't want them. After we got locked out and we didn't prevail uh, to uh, uh, keep our contract or to even be employed by the other union because they wouldn't hire us, um, and I, I was really down. It was some of my darkest days, but I still felt, as my dad used to tell me, hey, man, just believe in the ILWU. And, um, you know, I thought uh, that there would be better days, and I, and I wanted to be part of the solution. A major part of the solution that Ray provided the ILWU throughout his career has been his ability to develop relationships with other union leaders around the world. Internationalism was one of the major principles promoted by ILW founding father, Harry Bridges. After Dave Arian was elected ILW president in 1991, he endeavored to reignite the union's affiliation with the International Transport Workers Federation. He hired Ray to head up the union's international department and to serve as one of the two lead West Coast ITF inspectors that ship crews could call for representation if they were being mistreated. 
I remember one time this man called and he said, is Mr. Ray there? And I said, no, he's not here right now. And he said, can you tell him we're hungry? And I go, what do you mean you're hungry? And he says, well, we work like 12, 14 hours a day and they give us two pieces of bread and an egg in the morning and then nothing else. You know, seafarers uh, typically uh, that are in distress, uh, that are on like night watch, would uh, go to a pay phone uh, on the dock and uh, we had uh, I, our phone numbers for ITF inspectors in a phone directory uh, that was published around the world. So they'd get their little booklet and they'd call me at two o'clock in the morning and say, Mr. Ray, hey, uh, we're on this ship and we haven't been paid in six months. Uh, you know, uh, they're abusing us on board the ship. And I've had some incredible cases of exploitation of seafarers from countries all over the world. In addition to working as an ITF inspector, Ray was also tasked by Dave Arian with helping to set up the International Department of the Union. And Ray embarked on developing relationships with waterfront union leaders throughout the world. It was Ray's connection to these leaders that gave him a key role to play for the ILWU in 2002, when the union was locked out by the Pacific Maritime Association during the contentious contract negotiation between the two sides. Jim Spinoza, the ILW president in 2002, tapped Ray to set up all of the international meetings for the union. Where I really found Ray very, very useful is on the international scene. You know, the ILW belongs not just locally here or in, in San Francisco, but you know, we belong to major unions throughout the world. When Ray would go to these different conferences and these different ports and get to know the leaders, and they got to know him, and they got to know each other's hearts, when the call was made by Ray to say, the ILW needs you, they were there. They were there because Ray was able to put that face to the ILWU. 2002 was a culmination of attacks on longshoremen that were taking place around the world. Uh, significant things had happened. 1995 in Liverpool, uh, they went after one of the strongest longshore groups uh, in Europe and the UK and they uh, ended up effectively um, getting rid and locking out the Liverpool dockers permanently. Never got their jobs back. And the uh, Maritime Union of Australia in 1998 were under attack by Patrick Stevedar. They trained scabs in Dubai and flew them in and on a hostile takeover, uh, they came in with uh, Rottweiler dogs and security with Belaclava mask, and it was, and they locked the longshoremen out in every port in the country. A court order allowed the Australian dock workers to return to their job, but the attack on longshoremen throughout the world was not over. During the 2002 contract negotiation between the ILWU and the PMA, it was widely believed that the PMA lead negotiator Joe Miniachi had no intention to bargain in good faith. He was known as a union-busting type guy that holds the line for their side, and they particularly brought him in to do just that. So he spent many, many days and, and months in Washington, D.C., setting up with the Bush administration and putting pressure from the outside in so that he, they would be able to achieve their goals. And I remember just crying because... I'd already been through the ICTF. I'd already lost one job. And I was so afraid that we were gonna lose this next job. And I didn't know what we were gonna do because we weren't necessarily young anymore. Now we had a child, you know? Um, I knew the impact to the world that we had to fight. We had to win this or it, it was gonna be our downfall. It was gonna be, I don't know if we could ever come back from it. As the fight between the PMA and the ILWU intensified, Joe Miniachi pulled out a card that he thought would intimidate the longshoremen. He threatened to lock them out of their jobs. And I reassured him over and over again, look, you can talk lockout all you want. We came from the streets. That's where we came from. We're not afraid to fight our fight, if that's where you want to put it, you know? But the economy and everybody else is saying, let's get a contract. But if you want to go there and you're looking for a brawl with the ILWU, you'll find us we're ready to go. Miniachi thought that Spinoza was bluffing and ordered a lockout to prevent longshoremen from going to work on the waterfront. It proved to be a major tactical blunder by Miniachi as it only strengthened the unity of ILW members. 
you know, guys on the waterfront aren't always friends. There's a lot of relationships. There's good relationships, and uh, there's some distant ones. But there's one thing on the waterfront when the employer, and particularly the PMA, shows no respect for the union, and they locked us out while we were bargaining in good faith, that we locked arms up and down the coast, every local. The dock workers from around the world, their leadership, flew to San Francisco, and we met secretly. And Ray was very instrumental through his contacts and his setting all that up and that, that the ILW, that they came and were there at our side. One of the groups that visited San Francisco to offer the ILW support during the negotiation was the Panama Pilots Union. Joe Miniachi, the CEO of the PMA, had said that they were going to uh, bring ships around through the Panama Canal and unload them on the east coast of the United States. So uh, that's when I said, I'm gonna contact my friends in Panama, the Canal Pilots. The ILW negotiating team did not tell their PMA counterparts that the Panamanians would be visiting until the very end of one of the sessions between the two sides. And then uh, President Spinoza said, and we have one last, uh, uh, we, have, uh, we, we have a few other guests that are visiting today, and uh, they're from Panama. And uh, he said, in fact, they're the Panama Canal pilots. And I remember one of the employers beating his fist on the table and said, what are their names? What are their names? You know, Jim shook his finger at the employer and said, you don't need to know their names. You just need to know they're friends of the ILWU. The support that the Panamanians provided at the 2002 negotiation planted the seeds for discussion to organize a Panama Canal division of the ILWU. It made strategic sense for the ILWU to extend its coastwide unity to the Panama Canal. 30% of our cargo that comes from Asia, it's not for this part of the country. It's going to move on. It's going to go by rail or truck. It's moving on. It's discretionary cargo. It's that 35% of cargo that we find ourselves that we continue to try to, to hold on to. And that's Panama Canal is vital to the Asian movement of cargo. When Captain Lundor Rankin and a few other pilots came up, um, I said uh, to Lundor, I said, you know, we really should talk about our two unions joining forces. Who would have known a few years later, in 2009, I became uh, international vice president of the ILW and uh, Lenore Rankin became the president of the Panama Canal Pilots, and we made it happen. In addition to the strategic benefits of merging the two unions, the ILW leaders felt proud of their ability to give Panamanian workers a path to a better life. Many of the longshore workers in Panama were in the same impoverished conditions as West Coast dock workers before the 1934 strike won them the union that forever changed the fortunes of longshore work. We find workers all over that are trying to unionize, that, that need to unionize, that find themselves in situations that were just like we were in 34. I've been to Panama and you go to the city and there's these beautiful buildings, but next door, it's these houses built out of uh, pallets and things. The pilots were already doing pretty well financially, but the dock workers were very, very poor. And the fact that they got representation, which allowed them to uh, get better wages, they wear their work shirts and their hats with such pride. You know that you've done something in those people's lives that has really changed them. Helping people to change their lives for the better is a core value the ILWU tries to instill in its members. This is especially true in the towns that surround the harbor area where ILWU members make up such a big part of the community. I grew up in a great neighborhood, in a great town, loaded with other longshoremen. I, re I can still remember maybe like in fourth grade going around the room when the teacher was asking kids, you know, what they wanted to be when they grew up. and. Um, you'd catch kids saying, I want to be a crane driver. The ILW is the town. It's, it's our communities. We're the guys that live in the area. We're here. We participate with all the community activities, little leagues and everything else. We're there. Most of the leaders in the ILWU, um, in some shape or form, are probably involved 
and two or three outside organizations as well. And for those that aren't leaders, we've got hundreds of people that are involved in the community. We're so grateful to have the ILWU that it's ingrained in us, okay, we've been blessed, now we need to give back. Giving back is something that has driven Ray and Kathy throughout their lives. For Kathy, volunteering for one organization in particular has deep meaning to her family. I'm part of a national organization called Parents of Murdered Children. 31 years ago, my nephew was murdered and uh, it, it devastated and traumatized our life. And even though it's been 31 years, it still does. We still have to go to the parole hearings. But when that happened, my sister-in-law needed some support. So we found a support group and it ended up being Parents of Murdered Children. It was actually at Mrs. Tate. Sharon Tate's mom's house. And we went there for a few years until Mrs. Tate couldn't do it anymore. And then 11 or 12 years ago, um, I had two cousins murdered in the Harper area. And my cousin and I looked at each other and they said, there are way too many homicides, but not enough groups to help the families after, after. So we reached out to the National and we opened our chapter and it's called the Los Angeles Chapter of Parents of Murdered Children. We've had a lot of our longshore uh, brothers and sisters that have had children murdered. And uh, to be home and hear my wife pick up the phone and some parent is just grieving and nobody can understand um, the pain they're going through. And Kathy say, well, I remember the day my nephew, you know, was shot. And uh, it touches me as a husband. She's there for so many people. Being there for others has played a key role in the lives of Ray and Kathy Familetti. Serving your brothers and sisters is a value that is at the core of the LWU and has driven Ray throughout his career in the union. I think what makes Ray tick is his passion was born out of struggle. And I believe until the day he dies, it'll always be that there's always going to be somebody that needs to be lifted up and given the opportunities that we've been given. So I think he's always going to um, try to be there for others in some shape or form, no matter what. Ray's situation is no different than mine, no different than I think anybody that's in this union that has uh, been blessed to have... Uh, had the opportunities that the union has presented and makes you want to work harder for it because it represents the right things in life. You know, we're helping people because that's what we're all about. The ILW is uh, the fabric of the community and it's just the way Harry organized this union uh, in the 1930s. We were wharf rats, you know. We, we weren't uh, looked at the way we are today, but this union has never forgotten where it's come from. That's why uh, Local 13, all the locals up and down the coast have their community outreach. We're all about the community because we are the community.